This week at Starbase, High Bay Demolition is finally completed, construction continues on Booster 18 and Ship 38, and SpaceX launches Flight 9. Were all the objectives achieved? Was the flight considered a success or a failure? Well, let's dig into this update and find out. Starship 35 left the Massey outpost on Friday morning and was brought back to the build site for final launch preparations. The ship was brought in through the winding back road at Sanchez and into Mega Bay 2. Later inside the bay, the ship would be loaded with dummy Starlink satellites. Work continued on the tank farm expansion with the addition of two more pump motors to the methane side of the pumping station. Back in Mega Bay 2, Ship 35 was moved from the static fire stand to a transport stand. Dummy Starlink satellites were staged in front of the bay to be loaded into Starship 35. The chopsticks at Pad A were given a few actuation tests, moving from side to side before being lowered back down to the hard stop at the base of the tower. No catch was planned for Flight 9, and the chopsticks would only need to stack the ship and the booster. The Starlink satellite loading jig was lifted up to Ship 35. Workers spent the next two hours working the jig into place. Crossbar elements, which are used to align and move the satellites for deployment, were then loaded and installed inside the ship. After weeks of preparations, four excavators began to pull and the remainder of the high bay's highway side wall was brought down, falling into the clearing between the excavators and the bay. A hydraulic shear was used to break and pull down the remaining upright section of the wall. Crews got right to work with cutting torches, breaking down the beams and columns into short links for recycling. By early afternoon, most of the cutting work was already complete and workers got ready to pull down the next wall. Booster 14 rolled out of Mega Bay 1 ahead of relocation to the launch site for its second flight with its canted grid fins realigned on exit. The back wall of High Bay was the next to be pulled down. A pair of excavators flanking the drop zone gradually worked the wall off its supports and soon enough it was toppled over. Four excavators joined in to topple the third and final section of High Bay, bringing it down late in the afternoon and clearing the way for the construction of Giga Bay. Tower 1 began preparing for a booster lift, with the stick starting to move a bit, followed by the ship quick disconnect retracting. The arms were then put through a short test, moving to the launch position before resetting for booster lift. Over at the build site, the first of the Starlink simulators was loaded into Starship 35. These dummy units are designed to test the deployment mechanisms inside the ship for future operational use with next-generation Starlink satellites. Eight of these dummy satellites were loaded into the ship. Workers began moving Booster 14 to the launch site in the evening, bringing it down Highway 4 to the launch complex for its second and final flight. The flight plan called for testing an off-nominal landing burn over the Gulf with only two of the three center engines. 36 tanker loads of water were brought to the launch site to fill the pad's deluge system for Flight 9. Before we go any further, I'd like to thank all of our YouTube members, Patreon members, and everyone else that watches and subscribes to our channel. If you enjoy this type of content and want to stay up to date on all things Starship, make sure you subscribe if you haven't already and consider becoming a member. A lot of coordinated effort goes into making these weekly updates, and without your continued support, we wouldn't be able to keep up with SpaceX's rapid development. So thank you again from all of us here at Lab Padre Space. Now let's get back to business. Booster 14 was moved between the chopsticks early on Sunday morning ahead of its lift onto the launch mount. Once the booster was fixed to the chopsticks, the lift began and the booster was soon set down inside the center ring mount. With the booster on the mount now, the chopsticks were released and reset to the resting position off to the side of the base of the tower. Inside Mega Bay 2, Ship 35's payload bay door was closed for the final time and the ship was ready for flight. Ship 35 was brought out of Mega Bay 2, ready and waiting to roll out to the launch site. The ship's journey to the launch site began shortly after noon and it arrived to the complex about 40 minutes later. Ship 35 featured multiple improvements over Ship 34, including better vibration management and more preloading on the engine mounts to help prevent the engines from failing in flight. Once inside the gate, the ship was moved between the chopsticks and the chopsticks were moved into the lift position underneath the forward flaps. Afterwards, the lift pins were then engaged. After that, the ship's aft flaps were extended to their full width, readying it for lift. Later on, the Pad B launch tower's chopsticks were then raised up the tower. 
Elon recently confirmed that this tower will perform ship catches and work continues to ready the tower for its first catch attempt on a future flight. A few hours later, Ship 35 was lifted off the transport stand and set on top of the booster. A lot of time was spent on final alignment before the ship was eventually set down on the booster hot staging adapter, completing the stack. Another section of Booster 18's liquid oxygen tank was brought out of Star Factory on Monday morning and sent to Mega Bay 1 for stacking. Despite the imminent evacuations of Star Factory and Starbase, production continued unabated with Ship 38's aft engine skirt section being moved into Mega Bay 2 for stacking. Leading up to the launch day, final checkouts were done with the ship's flaps being actuated and tested, along with the chopsticks also being put through the motions. 10 hours before T-0, a storm cell hit the launch complex area and the chopsticks were once again activated to safe the ship while the high winds blew through. Eventually, the storm dissipated, the pad was cleared, and the tank farm came alive. With all the tank farm systems in motion, the tower started receiving cryogenics to cool down the tower plumbing. After a couple of holds to ensure all systems were nominal, the flight deck gave the green light and the Starship Super Heavy launched into the Texas skies. The key objectives for this booster's mission included flying the booster during re-entry at a more aggressive angle of attack to gather data on aerodynamic control. While it didn't achieve a controlled splashdown, it did complete its objective of flying under the aggressive angle of attack and gathering valuable data. Starship 35's key objectives included second engine cutoff, suborbital insertion, payload deployment, Raptor engine relight, and a controlled re-entry and splashdown. The ship did complete second engine cutoff and reach orbital velocity and altitude. It was also noted that the heat shield tile did not appear to experience any significant loss of thermal protection tiles as seen in previous launches. Unfortunately, the payload door seemed to malfunction and the ship was unable to deploy any mock satellites. During the coast phase, a fuel leak caused further issues resulting in a loss of control and putting the ship in a tumble. As a result, the engine relight test was cancelled, the ship had an uncontrolled re-entry into the atmosphere and eventually destructed over the Indian Ocean. Keeping in mind that these missions are a part of research and development, and although both the Super Heavy Booster and Starship were lost, the mission provided critical data and Flight 9 is considered a partial success, especially regarding the reuse of the booster and the performance of the heat shield and other various systems. The following day, over at the Massey Outpost, Test Article B18.1 finished a round of cryo-testing, verifying the integrity of the Block 3 Super Heavy's design. The ship cryostand was moved into Mega Bay 2 in the evening, and Starship 37 was soon transferred to it for its first trip to the Massey Outpost. Ship 37 began its trip on Thursday morning, rolling out through Sanchez onto Highway 4 before heading up to Massey's. The ship's flaps and most of its heat shield tiles have not yet been installed. Here we can see quick disconnect hardware for the Block 3 booster being rolled out to the launch site. The new boosters will have two interface ports and separate housings, which will help keep the methane and oxygen from mixing. A vaporizer was also delivered to the launch complex, continuing build out of the tank farm expansion. Crews also continued their work to close back up the front facade of Star Factory, reworking the edges and corners of the shortened structure. Meanwhile, Ship 36's third vacuum raptor was moved into Mega Bay 2 for installation. Over at Pad B, the third water distribution manifold was installed on the launch mount. The pad deck has extensive water cooling to help prevent damage and erosion during launch. Back inside Mega Bay 2, Starship 36's left aft flap was installed. Once the mishap investigation into Flight 9 is complete, the ship will be modified and prepared for Flight 10. The Pad A chopsticks were raised up to the catch position and put through their paces, making sure they were still within tolerance after flight before being lowered back down. This week at the Cape, Signet Warhorse 2 brought home Just Read the Instructions and Booster 1095 from the Starlink Group 12-15 launch. The booster made its first stay at the dockside stands, staying at the docks for a few days for stowage before returning to Roberts Road. The Starlink Group 12-22 mission lifted off on Saturday, lofting 23 Starlink satellites into orbit from Space Launch Complex 40 on Booster 1069's 24th flight. Doug then returned to port two days later, bringing back fairing halves 220 and 191 from the launch. 
Three days after the launch, Signet Warhorse 3 towed a short fall of Gravitas and Booster 1069 back into port for its own stay at the docks. The booster's stay was a short one, and it was soon lowered onto a transporter for its return to Roberts Road. Signet Warhorse 2 didn't wait long to bring Just Read the Instructions back out to sea for the Starlink Group 10-32 launch, and was joined by Bob just a day later for fairing recovery. Starlink Group 10-32 lifted off from Launch Complex 39A on Wednesday atop Booster 1080, carrying 27 satellites into orbit for the booster's 19th flight. Signet Warhorse 3 towed a short fall of Gravitas out to sea for the GPS-3 SV-08 launch and was joined by Doug for fairing recovery operations ahead of the mission's scheduled Friday launch. Preparations began on Thursday for the Axiom-4 mission, with teams extending the crew access arm and reconfiguring the transporter erector for Dragon. If all goes well, Axiom-4 will lift off on June 8th and fly to the International Space Station for a multi-week mission. And there you have it, another SpaceX and Starbase weekly update brought to you by Lab Padre. Don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button if you haven't already, guys, and we'll see you next week. Thanks for watching. Lab Padre out.